Greetings. My name is Dr. Zebulon Maletsky. I'm the chair of marketing and PR for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History and the executive producer of Asala TV. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our series in retrospect and prospect topics in African American life and history produced, edited, and hosted by our very own Dr. Lopez Matthews, chair of the Publications Committee for Asala. Dr. Lopez writes, in remembering Dr. Carter G. Woodson, Mary McLeod Bethune wrote the article, The Negro in Retrospect and Prospect. In this piece, she examined the past, foretold the future, and issued a challenge to the post-war informed and educated Black American citizenry. In this spirit, we speak to interesting figures in the Black community to discuss the past, the present, and what we imagine the future will hold. We hope you'll continue to join us and enjoy this series. Thank you. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm Lopez Matthews, Chair of the Publications Committee for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And I am here with Dr. Mikola Abdullah, President of Virginia State University. And we're here to have a brief discussion about the importance of HBCUs in the African American community. And so Dr. Abdullah, my first question is, how have HBCUs contributed to the history of African Americans? Well, first, Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here and glad to engage in this in this conversation. Uh, how have HBCUs contributed? I'm sorry, you read the question one more time. Make sure how, I got it. How have HBCUs contributed to the history of African Americans? HBCUs have been critical uh, to the history of African Americans in this country. Uh, as we go through this period of, of unrest now, it's important to realize that at various stages, at various milestones of the struggle of African people in the, in the, Amer in the United States of America, that there have been bit different solutions put in place to try to mitigate those challenges in different times. And at one point, uh, those solutions were HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, uh, to provide critical forms of education uh, for those who are fresh out of being enslaved uh, here in this country. And so uh, there are some who say, and I agree, uh, that there would not be a, a black middle class, if you will, in the United States without HBCUs and that if we didn't have HBCUs right now, that we would be fighting to invent them, uh, that they're that important uh, to our, our struggle here in this country. You know, that's important that you say that, that there would not be a Black middle class without HBCUs, because the, bit of, the HBCUs have really been the incubators of Black creativity and intellectual development mm -hmm. since the end of the Civil War, and some even before the Civil War. And so that does lead me into my next question is, since they have been sort of incubators of the Black professional class, the Black middle class, and so how has this continued despite the end of segregation? Because there's been a lot of talk of, okay, Black students can go to any school, but HBCUs have remained and maintained, sort of maintained their place as incubators of Black creativity. And so how has, have they been able to continue this? since desegregation. Well, I think it's, it's very interesting because in many ways, HBCUs continue to do the job uh, that we've always done. And so when you talk about kind of the first generation of, of young people uh, to pursue higher education, uh, looked towards HBCUs because those were the only, only institutions that were available to them. Um, sometimes some of their children, as they got older, have, have migrated to some of the other schools, some of the PWIs and taken advantage of the opportunities that African-Americans have fought for, which is the ability to go to any college that you want, but still the vast majority of first-generation African-American students, uh, those who are looking to, 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 to change the trajectory of their family, change the trajectory of their, of their communities, still by and large come to HBCU. Uh, and you can tell by the percentage of, of Pell-eligible students uh, that attend our institutions. Um, and so we're still in that business of training that first generation um, of really instilling a sense of pride and a sense of ownership uh, for, a new for a new generation of students. And I also wanted to say, because I think it's, it's particularly important, um, I did kind of concentrate on the, on, the, on the economic aspect of, of what HBCUs have done. 
Uh, but the, we also have been the incubators of the protest movements also uh, in the United States. And so the, the ability for uh, black students to choose other institutions, um, that movement was incubated at HBCUs. Uh, and so we've always played a critical part of what has been economic, uh, economic progress, educational progress, um, health, uh, progress in the healthcare arena. Well, HBCUs have played a critical role in that for African Americans. That's a great point you made, and so I'm going to make a be very specific in my next question and ask okay. how has BSU contributed to the legacy of African American achievement? Uh, Virginia State University, uh, founded in 1882 here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we sit just outside of Petersburg in the village of Ettrick, uh, here high above the Appomattox. I have to say that high above uh, the Appomattox. Uh, Virginia State University is was one of the first state institutions that was founded that offered collegiate degrees at its opening. Many of our HBCUs were founded um, as normal and industrial uh, institutions, and so was Virginia State. But as early as 1882, we were offering collegiate degrees. Uh, Virginia State University was the first university in the Commonwealth of Virginia um, where men and women received higher education degrees together. The first woman to graduate with a degree, with a collegiate degree in the Commonwealth of Virginia graduated from Virginia State University. And so we have always been on the forefront of that movement of education. Our first president, John Mercer Langston, formerly a dean at uh, Howard University, was the first president of Virginia State, went on from Virginia State to become uh, a, a black congressman here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so we have been, since 1882, we have been a part of the movement of making sure that African Americans had access to things that others may not have wanted us to have access to. And you can draw that all through the, uh, the civil rights movement and even up until today, our students today are participating uh, in the protest uh, to make sure that their voices are heard so that we can move uh, the nation forward. So I'm, I'm proud of our history, uh, I'm proud of our present, and I'm excited about our future. That's fantastic. <laughs> and it's great to, you know, really hear that. And I hope that our viewers really take that to heart just to see that HBCUs have really been the driving force a lot of times in the African American community and in the development of the African American community. Mm -hmm. And so I do have another quote that ties into that. And it's, uh, well, not a quote, but a question. That is a quote. Uh, there's a quote that's going to be at the start of this uh video and it's from the father of black history dr carter g woods and it is the mere imparting of information is not education and i think that that's a very powerful quote and very telling quote as he wrote the miseducation of black folk talking about how black people needed to be educated and so how do you think hbcus have embodied that quote that the mere imparting of information is not education well, I'll tell you, well, one, that, that, uh, that statement is a lot to unpack. Uh, and we all know that uh, Carter G. Woodson was a, a, a genius uh, in his time and in our time. Uh, and so if I come up short in trying to explain his quote, please understand that it's because I don't have the genius that Carter G. Woodson had. Um, but I think that one of the important things about HBCUs is that, and I can speak to this from my career at, at Howard University, is that there were people who they knew their information. They knew their information. They were committed to teaching. But they also cared about who I was, right? And so because they cared about who I was, I fell in love with them. And then through, by extension, I fell in love with the information, right? And so I wanted to be them. Uh, and I wanted to know what they knew. And I wanted to have an intelligent conversation with them. And so it's, the, it's that personal connection uh, that makes our institutions so special. And I'm not saying that other schools don't have it, but I'm saying it is a mandatory part of HBCUs. And whether you are um, Black, white, or Asian, uh, as a professor at, uh, at an HBCU, everyone knows that you've got to give more to your students at an HBCU than you give somewhere else. But it's that giving, it's that connection, um, it's, that, uh, uh, it's that connection that makes it so that students want to be they want to be you. Like when you, when you teach in class, they want to be you. And, and through that, they learn a love for history because they see your love for history, right? And so it's more than just imparting information. You have to give some of yourself 
And by giving some of yourself, I think it, it helps to create the critical thinkers. And I think this is really what Carter G. Wilson was going for, right? Is that you, you've got to become a critical thinker and to be able to synthesize that information. But I think part of that comes through a master teacher and HBCUs have typically always had more master teachers in our environment. You know, that's a great, uh, that's a great point you made as a, someone who went through HBCUs, undergrad and grad, went to Coppin State in Baltimore for undergrad, went to Howard for master's and PhD. I really got that as a student. And then now as a person who, I'm a librarian at Howard, I teach at Bowie State and Coppin State. And so as a professor and as a librarian, I really kept that sort of HBCU teaching mindset of being a mentor to your students and then parting information, but helping them understand how it relates to them. I actually got an email from a former student thanking me for my class because they said they really understood what they were doing today in the protests right. because of what they learned while they were in class. And it was just, I was like, huh, made me smile because I really said, oh, okay. So they are listening and they are, they do get it. You know, and that's something that I got at an HBCU. And that's, and that's because it's more than, like students will say casually, like, I mean, I, we have students at Virginia State and they'll say, well, I love Virginia State. But if you unpack that statement, what they're really saying is, I have a connection with someone at Virginia State that means something, right? That's somebody. They, when they say I love Virginia State, they're not talking about the building, they're talking about somebody in particular and their connection with faculty and staff, the connection with their fellow students. And that connection is powerful. It's, and you, you can't, there's no way you can run into an HBCU graduate and ask them about their career and they won't, they won't turn around and say, I had this professor. Everybody's got that story, right? Because that is the story of our institutions. Oh yeah, definitely. And so uh, what do you see as the role of HBCUs as we navigate our current period of national crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as you know, our national protests or international protests? Right. What do you see as the role of HBCUs in this moment? I, you know, I think the role of HBCUs is, is very similar to what it's always been. It, it, is the, it, is the, it is one of the solutions that our ancestors and elders gave us to help to incubate our children of tomorrow, right? And so to continue to support them, to continue to uh, do the work that we need to do to make sure that the next generation uh, is ready, uh, that they're learning the things that they need to learn and understanding them that as they are learning those things, that they, it might not be comfortable for us, right? But to provide that environment uh, for them to be able to do that, to become the best versions of themselves, um, all of the families and communities that that wrestled to send their most precious asset uh, to college, right? Their, their children, right? these families and communities sent their children to college for the purpose of these young people coming back and improve the community. Um, we have to continue to be a part of that uh, very important process. So, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Hey, and we're excited to have you, you know. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that, uh, I do wonder about, and I know this is one of our precinct questions, but a big topic today is the future of higher education and the future of colleges. And so what do you see as the future of our HBCUs as we move forward? Since everyone says nothing will ever be the same after COVID-19, what do you see as the future of our HBCUs? I tell you, I think we are in the middle of one of the biggest disruptions in everything that we've ever seen. Uh, and that disruption is also going to be in education, and it'll definitely be in higher education. And if I, um, if I was able to answer this question perfectly, uh, that would mean I have a crystal ball, uh, and I do not. Um, but I do know this. I know that, that interactions like this, that we've developed a different level of appreciation for these kinds of digital interactions. Um, I believe that our students um, our faculty and staff, uh, whether it's inter-staff uh, related conversations or business related conversations or students in classrooms, uh, I think the, the, there will be a much more of a need for instant uh, digital interactions, sometimes to take the place of, of, of personal interactions and sometimes just because that's what we're used to. Uh, and, and I think also having more personal environments. I'm sitting, of course, in my home and Looks like you might be sitting in your home too. 
um, that now we have real workspaces uh, in our environments at home. And so I think a, adapting to a much more technologically friendly environment, uh, an environment where we can switch modes quickly. I can see you in person today and see you remotely tomorrow. Uh, where we invest in, in making sure that all of our customer service uh, can be delivered in this kind of very similar way, the way we've been doing it, if you will, for about a month or two months. Uh, I think that the world will demand more of that. Uh, and we'll, just, we'll have to be ready to do it. And the institutions that can adapt quickly and remember that we are, we are never going back to the fall of 2019, right? Even when COVID is over, uh, the new world and the new world in higher education will never look again like it did in the fall of 2019. And the quicker that we begin to vision that, begin to think about that and begin to adapt to that, uh, the more prepared we'll be for the future. I think that's a great answer, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I do wonder what, you know, the future will look like. And so I love asking people that question just to see what, you know, their own personal idea of what the future is gonna look like because none of us do know. And so none of us know. None we of us never know. have a crystal ball. So that, but I think that I hope that your vision comes to fruition, you know, that we do make a seamless and smooth transition. Oh, I think what we I, need to have. Look, it, it won't be seamless, nor will it be smooth, but we, but we, will, we will get there because we will have to get there. Or we, it's, it's not a choice. It'd be different if there was a choice, but the world is going to change, and we will either change with it or we'll be left behind. That's a good point and <laughs> very important. And so is there anything that you think you want to leave us with before we end our conversation today? No, I, I just uh, I want to commend you for the work that you're doing and commend your organization. Very familiar with it. Um, I'm proud to know some, some wonderful historians, uh, and I, I just hope that everyone continues to do the work uh, because it's important that um, our history, we, we have seen what has happened when our history isn't written correctly uh, and people don't understand what our real history is. And so I'm, I'm proud to know you and I'm proud to know your organization, and, and I look forward to the wonderful work that continues to come out. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and thank everyone who is watching. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation and stay tuned for our other episodes. Thanks again for watching. We hope you enjoyed this broadcast. We'd like to remind you to subscribe to Asala TV and you can also hit that notification bell to remind you of future broadcasts and episodes. We'd also like to ask you to consider making a donation to the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. If this information touched you, or if you learned something today, please consider making a donation no matter how big or small. You may make a donation by hitting the donate button in the description on the YouTube page for Asala TV. We thank you for your support and we look forward to seeing you in a future broadcast.